We're going to Greenland today. Uh, we're not going to Thule, even though the map has Thule on it. You've already heard about Thule. We're going a little bit further south uh, to a place where there was a U.S. Air Force base. Uh, when the U.S. Air Force pulled out, uh, they left behind the most wonderful runway in all of Greenland. The problem, of course, is there is no town there. There's just a runway. But that's where I'm flying into. And the reason is because when the Air Force moved out, they moved in about a dozen musk oxen. And it's those musk oxen that I want to see, and there are thousands of them now. When I think of Greenland, I think of glacier. But not all of Greenland is composed of glacier. Uh, there's no food uh, to speak of on the glacier. Uh, there's no way to get to it. You either have to be living off of uh, uh, marine uh, resources or there has to be grassland. This is reindeer country and that means there must be grass. And this is where the glacier meets the grassland. And although it looks like there's nothing to eat here for reindeer, there are in fact thousands of them in this neighborhood. Focus now on those two big blocks of ice on the right hand side. This is the leading edge of the glacier and the drop from the top to the bottom of those blocks of ice is about 50 feet. So why are we here in Greenland? Well, it's this shaggy guy. Uh, he looks like something out of the Pleistocene, and indeed he was in that period of time, and he ran around with uh, woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceros, and he's the only one of those three that's still alive in the Arctic. Now, the reason that I'm interested in them is because when I was taking advanced German, one of my assignments uh, was to translate a scientific article on muskox, scientific name ovibos, which means sheep cow. Uh, but they're neither a sheep nor are they a cow. Um, they're more of a goat. After World War II, these animals were very nearly extinct. Um, they had only remnant populations in uh, various places. Now, they had been hunted out of Alaska, for example. But after World War II, there was a recolonization effort, and a number of the animals were moved uh, in various places where they thought that they might survive successfully. Iceland was one of those places, uh, and so was Vermont. And they couldn't make it in either Iceland or Vermont. But Siberia, Alaska, and other locations where they currently weren't in Greenland did work out just fine. Anyway, that's why we're looking for about an 800-pound goat that lives in polar regions and stands about five foot tall at the shoulder. But where to find them? Well, it turns out that there's a very interesting place that you can go to find them. It turns out that during World War II, what became the United States Air Force had to maintain a number of bases uh, in Greenland for various purposes. Uh, one of the purposes was refueling for airplanes on their way to Europe. Even afterwards, uh, it was useful in the Cold War to keep eyes on the uh, Soviets and what they were doing in the North Atlantic. And one of those bases was Sonderstrom uh, on Sonderstrom Fjord. 
Sunderstrom uh, Air Base uh, has closed down as a U.S. Air Force base in the 1990s, but it left behind uh, the best runway uh, in all of Greenland. Uh, it's a little bit odd because the best runway in all of Greenland doesn't have a town attached to it. And incidentally, there is some talk about closing uh, the commercial aspect of this runway down uh, in 2024. But if that happens, uh, the people in this little community are going to be really, really hurt. Now, those 27 animals that they brought in in the 1960s have expanded to thousands, in part because there are no predators uh, in this area, and in part because uh, there is plentiful grass, even though the area is partially glacier, it's basically gl grassland. Um, and that is an ideal situation for musk oxen, and musk oxen normally give birth to a calf about once every year or two. But in this neighborhood, the musk oxen are so happy uh, that they're giving uh, birth to two calves per year on average. Incidentally, as you can see, musk oxen males uh, settle their disputes essentially the same way that human males do by headbutting. But back to predators. There are no predators in this neighborhood, no polar bears, no wolves, and nothing larger than an arctic fox, which cannot uh, threaten even a baby musk oxen. Uh, but they do have an instinctive defensive system that I would like to show you. Musk oxen. Males stand five feet at the shoulder and weigh a massive 800 pounds. Aside from polar bears, they are the largest animals that roam the Arctic tundra. But even they are vulnerable to predators. A pack of Arctic wolves catches the herd scent. The musk oxen scramble to form a defensive ring. The adults, equipped with long, hooked horns, are more than a match for the wolves. But it's not the adults the wolves are after. Now these animals may look stupid and slow, uh, but in fact uh, they kill people from time to time. Uh, you're warned not to get within about 30 meters or so of them. They are likely to charge, and that charge can be pretty terrifying. Now that brings us to Willie the musk ox. You know, Willie is the only musk ox that I know of that ever had a song uh, made up about him. I see by your fur, sir, that you are a musk ox. I see from your eyes there's something to say. Now this is the story of Willie the musk ox shot down by a Danish gunman and it happened this way born on an iceberg in eternity's fjord a big shaggy brute with a big mighty roar first came the Sunday when he was just three, he acted like he owned the whole down country. Now, Willie was probably one of the first uh, musk oxen brought into Sonderstrom, and uh, he was probably treated more like a pet than anything else. And uh, the boys at the base probably teased him from time to time, and uh, that uh, caused a problem. 
the result is he thought that he owned uh, the uh, entire base and surrounding area, uh, and uh, he didn't put up with uh, much baloney. Willie, Willie the Muscox, mayor of Sunderstown. Willie, Willie the Muscox, mayor of Sunderstown. Now, Willie was a visitor to Sunderstown each year. He went where he wanted to cause Willie had no fear. All the folks at Sunderstown left Willie alone. Cause everybody knew that Sunday was old Willie's home. Sunday was his home. Willie, Willie the Muscat, Sunday was his home. Willie, Willie the Muscat, Sunday was his home. Now Willie got a little older, and as the years went by, he got a little meaner, he got a little shy. He took the hate people from springtime through the fall. But oh, them big red fire trucks he hated most of all. Well, Willie used to uh, run servicemen up telephone poles and keep them there for a long periods of time. And once he had a dispute with a helicopter, and the helicopter did not come out well. From time to time, they had to drag old Willie off the runway. Willie, Willie the muskox didn't like people no more. Willie, Willie the muskox didn't like people no more. Now the grass was always greener over at the Sass Hotel. They couldn't get him to leave there. There weren't no way in hell. Even Danish cowboys with a winch truck and a rope. They couldn't budge old Willie. There wasn't any hope. Like the Sass Hotel. Willie, Willie the Muscox like the Sass Hotel. Willie, Willie the Muscox like the Sass Hotel. For all you Danish cowboys. Danish cowboy went riding out one cold and frosty morn. He tried to put a rope around one of Big Willie's horns. Willie bounced to the left and he bounced to the right, then he began to buck. Then there it was, a four-foot hole right through that red fire truck. Hated red fire trucks. Willie, Willie the muskox hated red fire trucks. Willie. Willie the muskox hated red fire trucks. Oh, clear the frozen runway, Big Willie's coming through. And if you don't move, it won't be long, he's got a piece of you. Hear the mighty roar of the muskox from a drinking Danish beer. I ain't a gonna fool with Willie, I'm getting the hell out of here. Willie, Willie the muskox ain't gonna see you no more. Willie. Willie the Muscox ain't gonna see you no more. In order to find the Muscox by air, I hired a helicopter. But the helicopter turned out to be an airplane, and the pilot is Mia. There wasn't any helicopter at Sonderstrom available. So this is a Patanavia, a P-68. And uh, you're going to be seated here on this side. I'll be on the other side. We can help coordinate. Um, as I mentioned, there will be the instrument board here. And there will be this loop. But there's plenty of space for you to film around here as well. And for you to have a better look ahead. During the summer, the muskox spend their time up on the glacier to keep cool. But it's October now, and the muskox should be coming down into the river valleys. But which river valley, and exactly where? So I'm going to see if I can find them by air. There's a river here that divides into two, and that creates an island in the middle. And that's where I find them.
from the air, the muskoxen are just little black specks and not moving very much. Muskoxen try to conserve their energy. The result is you can't hardly tell the difference between a rock and a muskox. As a matter of fact, the locals have a term that they use for rocks that look like muskox. They call them musk rocks. As a practical matter, Greenland has no roads. You can't get to any place by driving there. You have to either go by boat or airplane. The longest road is the one that we're on. It's only less than 50 miles long. And it goes up to the glacier. Now the good news is I have a four-wheel drive vehicle. The bad news is the weather has not been cold enough. The temperature has ranged very close to freezing. And what that means is that the ground is soft and the rivers are not frozen over. So I don't have very much traffic ability. Now I know that the musk oxen are on the other side of the river and there is no road on the other side of the river. And the low ground between us and the river is boggy. We can't take the four-wheel drive vehicle in there. As a matter of fact, if we could cross the river, that would be great. Uh, we talked about the possibility of getting a Zodiac and launching it across, but we couldn't find a good location to launch it from to get across to the other side and stalk the muskox that way. While we were discussing our dilemma at the side of this little brook, uh, we were being viewed by a reindeer uh, who wondered why we were out in the snow and stopped at this little brook and doing nothing. As a final resort, we parked our vehicle at the side of the road and hiked uh, towards the, uh, the river and we got as close to the muskox as we possibly could but it was snowing and that caused a problem all by itself now that is a muskox uh, back there but uh, this snow is uh, causing my camera to have some difficulty focusing on him The next day there was no snow, but getting in close enough uh, to get good photographs was still a problem. I still had to hike over marshy ground. This time there are two of them. One of the problems that I've always had with guides is they're used to people taking photographs but not video. And the result is, while you're taking your video, they're likely to be talking, even though you've told them not to do that. Now you have to go right. On the other hand, the good news is that the muskox are moving so you're pretty sure they're not musk rocks. <laughs> <laughs> 